Hello, welcome to Spirit of Innovation, local magazine style news and information brought to you by nonprofit JDS Creative Academy. I'm Mia Dignan. The housing crisis is still impacting Riverside County in a major way. We look into how the housing market has changed since the pandemic. Did you know that all households in California are now required to sort out their biodegradable trash? We find out what's needed to comply with this new law. We shine a spotlight on care options for those who can no longer live on their own due to advanced age or chronic illness. We also recap Riverside County's Black History Month celebrations and share other good to know community news and more. Now for the need to know. As of this taping, Riverside County COVID cases are trending downward. There are 323 people currently hospitalized with COVID, including 61 patients in the ICU. On February 15th, Governor Newsom dropped the mandatory indoor mask mandate, but all California public school students must still wear masks until further notice. Governor Newsom also announced last week that we will transition from a pandemic state to an endemic, moving us out of crisis mode. The governor rolled out the new Smarter Plan, which stands for the tools we now have to tackle COVID-19 challenges. Shots, masks, awareness, readiness, testing, education, and Rx meaning evolving and improving drug treatments. The Smarter Plan will guide California's strategic approach to managing COVID-19 while moving the state's recovery forward. Did you know that California's new organic waste disposable law, SB 1383, went into effect January 2022? Organic waste buried in landfills emits methane, which contributes to global climate warming. The new state law aims to reduce these emissions by processing natural food waste more efficiently. I spoke with Art Marquez from Waste Management, WM, to learn more. Organic waste creates 330 billion pounds of landfill garbage in North America each year. In an effort to lower that number, California became the first state to mandate organic waste reduction. 1383 is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in California in the last 30 years. It requires the state to reduce organic waste, which is your food waste, green waste, paper products, etc., cetera, uh, by 75% by 2025. In other words, the state must reduce organic waste disposal by more than 20 million tons annually by 2025. The law redirects residential organic waste to composting and digesting operations creating valuable soil amendments for agricultural use. The first step of the process requires residents to put their organic waste into the green yard waste bins. Some of those materials can include fruit, vegetable, bread and grain waste. You've got your floral and yard waste. You've got dairy waste that can also include soil paper. And within that though, there are certain things that we ask to not be included. So that would be anything with plastic, loose plastic bags. We ask that you don't place any serverware in there, any plastic containers, any foam containers, or any hazardous waste, of course. What about our trash bill? Is it gonna increase at all with this new law? So unfortunately, with this new law, there is what cities or counties call an unfunded mandate. This is a very costly process that asks our haulers to take this organic material to facilities that are further. It asks for more outreach, more monitoring, so there's a lot more required, and this does translate to an increased rate. I see. So what about businesses? Are they gonna have to comply as well? Yes, and the business aspect of that is to establish food recovery programs that help donate any unused food to those in need. So those type of programs will have to begin to get established. Primarily restaurants are required to have an organic recycling waste program that collects their food scraps on a weekly basis. They also need to have education signs that guide customers to recycle correctly. So it's, it's a pretty large process altogether. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. That was great information about the new law. But what about composting at home? Here is SOI correspondent Roman Hill and SOI team member Stefano Olaya with tips on how to get started. 
Thanks, Mia. Creating your own compost is really easy, and it makes an excellent amendment for your lawn and garden. Stefano, have you ever composted before? No, I haven't, but I know it involves yard waste mixed with kitchen scraps. Right. You have to mix in the right proportions so that it turns into compost, what people call black gold. Here's a picture of the end result. Wow, that's pretty cool. So how do we make it? There are a lot of different methods, but we're going to do one that's super simple. It's in a small bin, which is perfect for a small garden, but the method is pretty much the same. If you want to use a bigger bin, the most important thing is that you have a good cover. Do you know why? So that all the critters don't get in? Exactly. You don't want any getting into your compost. You start with a good bin, such as what we have here, then you drill in about 20 holes in the top and another 20 in the bottom. Do you know why? So that there's good airflow? Yes, getting oxygen in the container speeds breakdown of the materials, which causes the temperature to increase and creates a hot composting process. The first layer we start with are sticks or branches. It's for good drainage and airflow. The first two layers of the brown materials are carbon rich food sources for the organisms that break down the material. For the second layer, add small pieces of leaves and dry brush. How much leaves and dry brush do we use? Put on enough to cover the sticks, but make sure the brown layers together come to about half of your total materials. Third layer is good garden soil, which has microorganisms in it that accelerate the composting process. How much do we add of that? Just kind of sprinkle on a thin layer. If it's too thick, it'll block the airflow. We also add some food scraps in the next layer. You can collect kitchen scraps using a container like this one, which has a charcoal filter to keep the smell out. Scraps are a nitrogen rich material that heats compost up as it helps the microorganisms grow and multiply quickly. Kitchen scraps such as fruits and veggies, eggshells and coffee grounds are all good, but don't add any meat. Why can't we compost meats? It's not recommended because it breeds the bad bacteria we don't want in there. Add more soil on top to help with the decomposing process and it keeps the smell away. Add a little bit of water, just damp, not drench. It helps decomposing, then it's ready. Where is the best place to put it outside? We'll put it in a sunny spot, since the warmth helps with the decomposition. Do we leave it or do we need to stir it around? Occasionally stir it or shake it to help redistribute the hot compost in the center into a cooler outer compost. How do we know when it's ready? This small bin should only take a month or so, but you'll know when you see that all this material has broken down. The finished product will look and feel like dark, rich soil with a deep, earthy smell, and you shouldn't feel any heat in the materials. That was pretty easy. I really want to try it at home now. Great. We should all do our part. It's good for the environment and reduces landfill waste. Thanks for your help, Stefano. Back to you, Mia. Thank you, Roman and Stefano. It's good to know that it's so easy to compost at home. Maybe someone you know and care about is ready to move to a nursing facility or requires extra support at home. But deciding where they can live or who to bring in for help can be a bit overwhelming. Spirit of Innovation takes a look at what can be a daunting task and uncovers ways to make the transition a little less stressful for all. Those who can no longer live on their own due to advanced age or chronic illness have several care options to choose from. So you have independent living, which could be um, at a facility, but it's just separated where you just live in like an apartment. You can participate in other activities. Then there's also the assisted living. Could be in the same facility as independent, but that would require that you have a little bit of care. It can also range to full care at an assisted living. Then there is also memory care. That is if you have a memory diagnosis, Alzheimer's dementia, and you would go to that special unit. And then there's also skilled nursing rehabs. That is a short-term place. So basically, if you were in the hospital, you weren't ready to get to home or to your assisted living, it would be an in-between. Your health insurance might help pay for skilled nursing. The other options, however, are not covered. There is a veteran's benefit that if you are a veteran, but they will help pay for these either home care or facility. And then there's also some people have long-term care insurance, which is like a life insurance that would have got years ago that will help pay. There is Medi-Cal does pay a little bit for maybe an assisted living, but to find a facility that has a Medicare bed, 
Like let's say they have 100 beds, maybe they have five Medicare beds. Many opt to lower cost with home care and statistics show that 90% of seniors prefer to stay at home as long as possible. It's important, however, to screen home care agencies carefully. There is several things you should look for. One, we have to be licensed by the Home Care Bureau. So the state of California oversees what we do. Secondly, you should be having someone who is a W-2 employee come into your home, because then if anything happens to them, you're not liable. So if you have a 1099 contractor come out and they fall in your home, they can sue you personally. You should also make sure that their fingerprint background checked and have a TB test, a COVID vaccine, and make sure they have all their PPE gear in place. Well, when a patient has a life-limiting illness that continues to progress despite treatment, it's time to bring in hospice care. Many are not familiar with this service, so when help is needed, it's hard to know where to start. I'm here with Dr. Leslie Cochran, the Executive Medical Director for Hospice of the Valleys. Welcome. So please explain what hospice care is. Yes, hospice care is a comprehensive type of care that's designed for patients and families when the patient has a life expectancy of less than six months. And it covers all aspects of care from the medications, things like oxygen, medical supplies, more importantly, the human part of the care, which means you'll have a nurse at your bedside taking care of you, you'll have a doctor, you'll have social workers, spiritual care providers, and home health aides to provide services that the patient needs. So what should people be looking at when they're selecting in-home hospice care? That is a very important question. People need to know that they have a choice about selecting their hospice, and it's a very important choice. So I would strongly encourage that people do their research, and then they interview different, several different hospices. It's an important decision because these are people that are gonna be in your home taking care of your loved one. So who pays for this hospice care? I'm privileged to work with Hospice of the Valleys, which is a nonprofit hospice, and we have funding available for patients who don't have insurance. Oh, that's wonderful. Whether you're looking for hospice or other types of long-term care, it's good to know there are plenty of options available, making the transition a little less stressful. Experts say that it's important to look into senior options ahead of time before there is a crisis. We have links on our website to get your research started. Two years ago, when Spirit of Innovation explored the statewide housing crisis and its impact on the real estate market here in Riverside County, no one could have predicted. Just a month later, our world would be turned upside down by a global pandemic. With COVID-19 affecting the economy and house prices skyrocketing, we thought it was a good time to take another look at the housing issue. At the start of 2020, the median price of a home in Riverside County was around $400,000. As of January this year, home prices are selling for a median price of $560,000. In Southwest Riverside County, prices have shot up to over $800,000. Before the pandemic, I think it was just our regular cycle that uh, real estate generally does. The prices gradually raise, you know, and they were they were doing their normal thing during the pandemic. So we're in a whole different world, right? So the rates went crazy low. We were in the twos and the low threes. As a result of falling mortgage rates and a historically low supply of homes, wealthy buyers are bidding up the prices of available properties. It's people that are making a lot of money in the $100,000 range that are able to be more competitive. I have some clients that can qualify for $400,000. You can't actually buy anything for $400,000. Every now and again, something will come up, but the competition for it is so crazy. Home ownership is considered to be the pinnacle of the American dream. But for most California residents, there just aren't enough homes to make that dream a reality. And after the crash in 2008, um, we slowed down new home building. And I think that that is where the supply and demand issue really started, even prior to the pandemic, and then it just amplified everything. Home values aren't the only thing seeing an increase. Recent real estate reporters reveal a rapid rise in rental prices as well. Just like the housing market, we don't have enough rentals for people. And when there's not enough homes to purchase, the rent rates also increase with that. So people are capitalizing on these 
these poor people's situations where they have nowhere to go, but they're willing to pay whatever they have to in order to get into a place. Statewide, an increasing number of renters have nearly 50% of their income going towards rent. They have to make tough choices about food, about paying for other bills and obligations, and it hurts the economy as a whole because the cost of housing is taking money out of the growth of the rest of the economy. Research shows that adequate housing leads to stronger economics and healthier lifestyles. I challenge communities to think about the fact that if people that are necessary for your community to succeed cannot afford to live in your community, then you've probably not done a good job planning for the future. Experts say that housing crisis is a solvable issue. The number one solution to housing crisis is build more housing. We need more homes on the market. We just need more houses to be able to house our people. So the more houses we get, the less competition there is. One answer to call for more housing can be found in the increasingly popular development concept known as build to rent, which is simply building new homes solely for the purpose of renting out. When I hear of these new concepts coming in, I welcome it. We need rentals, we need housing, so we need homes. No matter how we put people in homes, they need to get in homes. It appears as though most cities understand the need for housing. And there are a lot of cities that are actually taking action to really try and produce housing. The city of Wildemar has approved construction for the first bill to rent development in Southwest Riverside County. And the single family home developers have realized the economics on renting their homes, given the current price of rentals and given the, you know, the, the lack of rental supply, um, the economics you know, are in their favor. There's some evidence to show that rising interest rates will slow demand. We're expecting four major increases over the next year. And I think that's going to change and shape the market a little bit. So when it comes to fall next year, I believe that we're going to start seeing a leveling off, that the market is going to start making a little bit more sense, that when you put a house on the market, it might sit there for a week or two weeks or three weeks. A slowdown in the housing market should help with housing and rental prices, but it is just a step in solving the California's housing crisis. It certainly has been a challenging time for the local housing market. In future episodes, we will explore how new laws and strategies help promote more growth and stability in Riverside County. Now it's time for our Good to Know, where we talk about community events, heartwarming news, and general good to know topics and information. Here is JDS Creative Academy intern Aaron Porras to start us off. Thanks, Mia. Are you looking for a job? The Temecula Community Services Department is hiring now. You can apply for some fun positions, such as a lifeguard or recreation leader. Also, mark your calendar for the premier job fair coming to the Temecula Promenade Mall on Saturday, March 19th. This job fair features hundreds of job openings. Make sure you bring plenty of resumes and be sure to dress for success. If you're passionate about issues facing the elderly and their families, you may want to run for the California Senior Legislature. The volunteer body's primary mission is to gather ideas for legislations at the state and federal levels. You have until March 31st to submit your election packet. Are you able to give the gift of life? The Red Cross is dangerously low on their blood supply. Levels are forcing some hospitals to defer patients for major surgeries. If you want to help, you can donate blood at Temecula City Hall's blood drive on March 9th. And get ready to shake your shamrocks on Friday, March 11th. The City of Marietta's Community Center hosts this fun Irish event. Wear your brightest green and bring your inner leprechaun to the party Irish style with dancing, activities, coloring, and light refreshments. You can party like it's your lucky day. A great way to get outside and give back to the community is through the City of Menifee's Adopt the Park Trail program. This volunteer-based program helps maintain the cleanliness of over 62 acres of parkland and five and a half miles of trails. 
You can also challenge yourself while enjoying nature by joining the City of Menifee's monthly community walks program. They explore new trails every month and welcome all ages, abilities, and pets. Join them at Lolladera Park on March 12th. February is Black History Month, and many Riverside County communities held events to celebrate African American culture and achievements. Here with a recap is correspondent J.K. Weldon. Thanks, Mia. There was definitely a lot happening in our county for Black History Month, starting in Southwest Riverside County. The Temecula Valley Museum unveiled a mural in Sam Hicks Monument Park, honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 12-year-old artist A.J. Peterson created this temporary public art piece along with contributors Kaya Bow and Landon Stengel. The museum also examined the culture and traditions of Benin, Africa as part of their second Saturday cultural celebrations. Benin was where the last known slave ship left to displace slaves to the United States. The celebration continued on February 19th at Temecula's Old Town Community Theater where the performance group Hip Lay Ballerinas put on an outstanding show. Further east, the Palm Springs Black History Committee's annual awards gala was held on February 5th and recognized those who have contributed to the success and achievements of African Americans in our society. And the Palm Springs Art Museum is featuring the work of black artists this month. Their opening reception included performances by the City of Palm Springs Park and Recreation Department's drill team and drum squad, and the ENJ movement. The museum also held other special presentations throughout February that were led by African American lecturers. In the city of Riverside, the Inlandia Institute's Black Landia event series held a number of literary workshops and lectures throughout the month. I spoke with Lisa Henry, chair of Black Landia Steering Committee, to talk more about their mission and what they've done to celebrate Black History Month. Uh, Blacklandia is a series of events, cultural events, that is hosted and supported by the Inlandia Institute. And Inlandia is literary and cultural nonprofit that serves Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And we are a very vibrant, creative uh, nonprofit that supports uh, poets, writers, creative artists, creative thinkers, and as a um, as a direct result of the events of summer 2020 and the murder of George Floyd in May of that year, Inlandia Institute really wanted to recommit in a public way to communities of color and to make sure that we as an organization that serves such a large part of inland Southern California, that we were helping to spotlight and uh, support what was already happening in the community. So every month we have numerous programs. No, obviously being Black History Month, were there any special events through Blacklandia that, uh, that were put on this month? Blacklandia started uh, sort of the celebrating Black History Month with a program on February 3rd, which was called Language of Healing, the Poetry of Hope. And it was really a wonderful round table. Romaine Washington, who's a local educator and poet, James Coates, Lydia Theon, where I, and George Hammond, all really wonderful writers who have been published. They shared not only their own work, but um, they took the discussion to a point of inspiration, self-care, and looking towards the future. We also had a, a tremendous program on, on Saturday, February 5th, a writing series, writing about black art with artist Richard Allen May III, and really exposing people who maybe weren't aware of the long tradition of, of visual artists uh, that, uh, that, that we've had. The next day we had a program, which was a conversation between two authors. Keenan Norris is a local writer, professor, um, thinker, uh, leader, and uh, he was presented in conversation with author and educator Eric Devon, a novelist and essayist, um, short story writer. Uh, Keenan 
discuss the latest novel, The Confession of Copeland King. And this online event was free, like most of Blacklandia events are free and open to the public. What do you feel makes Black History Month so important? And African-American heritage is very rich and really kind of wonderful and vibrant and diverse. It's not all one thing. So yeah, uh, it's important to have time to, to be able to focus on that and for people to learn about it, as well as for people who do know about it to celebrate it. The month isn't over yet. You can catch the third part of Blacklandia's writing about black art workshops on Saturday, February 26th. Also on February 26th, the Desert Highland Unity Center and the Palm Springs Black History Committee will hold the 35th annual Palm Springs Black History Month Parade and Town Fair. The parade starts on Palm Canyon Drive and is followed by the Town Fair at New City Park across from the Palm Springs Art Museum. And this Saturday, up in Riverside, the Wind of Spirit Worship Center hosts a community party and networking event with 100 own black, black owned businesses, a fashion show, some good gospel music, and a whole lot more. If you need more information about these events, check out the links on our website. Black history is not just American history, it's global history. And I invite you to celebrate black history and culture all year long by taking time to learn more about the contributions that black people have made that impact the world in significantly great ways. Back to you, Mia. Thank you, JK, for that great Black History Month recap. JDS Creative Academy wants to invite you to our studio to unwind and meet new people at the Temecula Valley Chamber Mixer on March 16th. You could enjoy networking, refreshments, and drawings for fabulous baskets. Here's something to whet your appetite. Looks like fun, doesn't it? I hope to see you here Wednesday, March 16th. DigiFest Temecula 2022 will be here before you know it. The sixth annual three-day festival, competition, and conference held April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th features an amazing speaker lineup. Here's a look at who's coming to DigiFest 2022. DigiFest Temecula 2022 festivities kick off Friday evening, April 22nd with two keynote speakers. TV personality Kari Michelson, known for her success portraying Katie Kaniski on Give Me a Break, and casting director, publicity coach Jenny Brown. The evening closes with a smash performance by singer-dancer, community activist Torin Floyd. On Saturday, April 23rd, DigiFest presents a full day of events with a prestigious animation comics panel of experts and two notable keynote speakers. Multiple Emmy Award winning director of photography, Mario Ortiz, and award winning director, director of photography, Nazreen Al Khatib. The three-day event culminates on Sunday, April 24th with a banquet featuring guest speaker Gina Tuttle, one of America's top voiceover artists, and the voice of the Oscars. You don't want to miss a minute of DigiFest. Tickets go on sale. It's not too late to submit your work to the DigiFest competition for your chance to win a Digi. Check this out. Submissions for DigiFest are now open. Early deadline is January 28th, 2022, and our late deadline is March 25th. Turn in something you created or go out and create something new. Visit www.digifest.com.
digifestsmecula.org for more info. We have top industry judges evaluating DigiFest submissions. They include animators and artists whose work has been seen in Aquaman and Harry Potter films, Emmy-nominated directors and producers, scriptwriters on current network television shows, high-level podcast host, artists, film development executives who collaborate with Mel Brooks and Spike Lee. So get those entries in by March 25th and you might be a Digi winner. Thank you to all of our viewers for joining us. You can find Spirit of Innovation on Rivco TV, local Marietta and Temecula stations, YouTube and all social media platforms. Be sure to follow us using the hashtag JDSFamily to keep up with everything that's happening here at the studio and in Riverside County. Don't miss the SOI training crew on radio station 1025 The Vine, seven days a week with the JDS Creative Academy Community Spotlight. You can also catch the SOI crew live streaming episodes of the SOI Update and co-hosting our new podcast, SOI Talk, coming out soon. Our next Spirit of Innovation episode drops March 24th. Until then, SOI out. farther down when I uh, talk about composting before is that too hard to go I don't know if I did if she thought it nothing okay yeah then we'll just roll with it if it's what did I say methane or something Muthane? oh